Welcome to the Andy Social Podcast. This is episode 182 with Aaron Samet, comic book creator of the brand new comic series, Maurice and the Metal. Issue one is out now. And before we kick into the episode, if we haven't met before, my name is Andy Dowling, and I also am the bass player for the Australian metal band Lord. And we have a brand new album coming out very, 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 very soon called Fallen Idols. And in the meantime, you can go to lord.net.au slash united which is track one of our brand new album, the first single called United, Welcome Back. If you go to that link, you can check out the video clip, which is also on YouTube and Facebook video. Uh, you can grab the song from Spotify or Apple Music or Bandcamp. You can grab the United t-shirt, and you can also see the track listing for the Australian version of the new album, Fallen Idols, which includes some very cool cover songs, which we're looking forward to sharing with you all. So lots of details over there, lord.net.au slash united. Go and check it out and let me know what you think. And in addition to playing in a metal band, I also host this self-starter podcast, which is all about small business, self-employment, and freelancing. So if that floats your boat, you can go to selfstarter.com.au. Season one is accessible through your preferred po podcast player. Oh, geez. Uh, and go and check all that out. Um, season two will be kicking off Monday, the 3rd of June at 5 a.m. That's how I roll, folks. Every fortnight, every Monday morning, 5 a.m., for the remainder of the year. Season two will be happening then. So you can go and check that out. Selfstarter.com.au. Stay tuned for season two. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. It's the shout out section of the podcast. Every week I thank some champion, some legend who supports me in the podcast. And it can be in a range of different ways. It could be leaving a review somewhere online, maybe on uh, Facebook, uh, on the Facebook page, or it can be on like Apple Podcasts or wherever. It doesn't really matter. Just just review it. Why not? Um, it could be buying some merchandise from the Bandcamp page. It could be uh, guest recommendations, a bit of social media love. It could be shouting me a beer via the PayPal button over at andysocial.net. It does not matter. It all helps, big or small. Keeps this whole thing a moving. So thank you so much to everyone that supports the podcast each and every week. However, each week I think one person put them on public record as my way of just giving back just a little bit to say thank you. So this week's shout out is for Dan Brown. I think this is the second time Dan's had a shout out on this podcast. Uh, Dan is from Dapto, uh, just, well, pretty much Wollongong, same sort of thing. And um, Dan has shouted me a beer with a nice little message attached to it, uh, which says, and I've, I've scribbled this down, so I'm not going to be able to read my own ha handwriting here, but it, I think it says, hi, Andy, uh, just wanted to give you a little something, keep up the good work and make sure you add another beer to your collection. I'm really looking forward to catching Lord in July. I'll be up front and center. So cheers, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, Dan is also the bass player for uh, Wollongong bass band Oshi. If I pronounce that correctly, you can go to oshi.bandcamp.com and that's spelled O-S-H-I-E.bandcamp.com or you can search for Oshi on Facebook as well. I think it's facebook.com slash Oshi band. But thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. When you hear this, shoot me a message. I'm going to flick you out a few little goodies. I'm going to find some stuff laying around. Just a little bit of a surprise because we all love getting something in the mail. Now, in addition to all of this stuff, I also have a page set up on my website, which has links to everything that I'm selling. It could be the band uh, online store. It could be Dominus Records online store. It could be my eBay and Discogs stores as well. Um, eBay, Jess and I have got a bunch of stuff that we're just selling, unwanted gifts, sorry folks, and a bunch of other stuff is on there. Lots of music memorabilia and, and uh, paraphernalia on there and a bunch of odds and ends. Discogs has a large chunk of my music collection. Um, so you can go and check all that out as well uh, by going to andysocial.net slash buy stuff. If you're having trouble accessing that page, shoot me a DM and I will give you some direct links to any of those stores so you can have a little bit of a sticky beak. But every week, I think just a few people that have been supporting the podcast and I'm grabbing my piece of paper just trying to stall. Uh, Zoe from Beijing in China. First uh, order from China. Thank you so much. Uh, Jan Christophe from G Dijon in France. Uh, guys, you know that my pronunciation sucks balls. So, you know, it's uh, amusing, I'm sure. Um, Xavier from Beaconsfield in Western Australia. Kieran from Towchester in UK. Liam from Broadmeadows in Victoria. And Jose from Aarhus in Denmark. Anyway, that'll do. Thank you so much, folks. Appreciate the support. And as I've mentioned in the past, if you buy anything from any of the stores and you mention that you heard me crapping on about this stuff on the podcast, please put a little message in with your order and I will add some extra goodies in. Just my little way of saying thank you. Cheers, folks. 
This week's episode is with Aaron Samet. Aaron is a writer and comic book creator. He is the mastermind behind the brand new comic series called Maurice and the Metal. And you can grab issue one right now by going to Maurice dash and dash the dash metal.com. Or you can just go to the show notes over at andysocial.net and click on the links there, including all the social media handles are over there as well. Um, in this chat, we cover a whole range of different things. Uh, we kicked it off with a bit of 90s NBA trading card talk, which to be honest, I probably could have just kept talking about that for 10, 10 hours straight without coming up for air. Maybe I should do a podcast series just on NBA trading cards. Hmm. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, and then we talk about our first moments discovering metal, um, the inspiration behind the comic book series. And uh, the tables are turned halfway through this chat with Aaron, where he starts asking me a bunch of questions about being in a band, um, almost a bit of a research project for him to uh, collate information and uh, and answers for uh, the next issues of the Maurice in the Metal series. So very interesting. Um, and it was a lot of fun answering a bunch of questions and reflecting on a number of things that have happened over the years um, with me being a musician and playing in Lord as well. So it was a very interesting chat and quite unexpected in places. So really, really cool. Um, before we quick kick into it, if you are listening to this episode on time, and I believe the release date of this particular episode will be the 23rd of May, if you are in Brisbane on Saturday, the 1st of June, uh, Aaron is doing a comic launch for Maurice in the Metal issue one, which is at Crowbar in Fortitude Valley in Brisbane. And that kicks off at 2 p.m. It is part of the heavy metal market day. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening there. There's uh, vinyl swaps, vinyl sell, uh, sa- selling, vinyl selling. Yeah, that'll do. Jeez, Andy. Uh, pinball and arcade machines. Um, and of course, there's metal and beer there as well. So if you've got plans on Saturday night, maybe start your Saturday a little bit earlier and uh, go to Crowbar in the afternoon, check out the metal market. And uh, actually, one thing I've just completely forgot to mention, Aaron will be giving away free signed copies of Maurice in the Metal issue one. So you don't even have to pay for it. Just gr- go down and grab a free copy and say hello to him. So uh, go and do that. Um, all the details are over on the Facebook page. It's a Facebook event. So you can go and check all that out. If you need a little bit more info, you can contact me directly or I'll have all of Aaron's contact details in the show notes over at andysocial.net as well. But uh, if you're in town, Saturday, 1st of June, uh, maybe go and check that out. And if you're not in Brisbane, or you're not planning to be in Brisbane, I have two extra copies of Maurice in the Middle as well. So first in, best dressed. If you are keen, shoot me a message and I'll flick you out a copy in the post. So you can do that. Okay, enough waffling on for me. Please enjoy this fantastic metal chat with Aaron Summit. I didn't read many comics as a kid either. Uh, you know, video games was all consuming for me, but, um, you know, I had like a, a small little stack, but nothing I would say that I was a huge comic book fan. Mm. Um, it was more of like just, just that idea of the excess of comics was such a great world to kind of lose yourself in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's cool. Cause I think, um, you know, a couple of people I've spoken to sort of, it's a similar sort of thing. And I guess it's, it's kind of like with anything really, I mean, you know, just books in general or you know people yeah. people are binge watching on netflix now or whatever it might be yeah. and, and you sort of it's just yeah. a it's a nice way to sort of disconnect for a while and just immerse yourself in another world yeah yeah that's true yeah and I, comics was really hard to come by when i when i was growing up and uh just some like there there are comics where they're called the uh the soft cover comics and then there's the, the hardbacks and there's the direct issue which is like the cheaper throwaway ones and that's the only ones I could get. And I never liked the idea that I'd buy, be buying a comic that was in at one point or in one day wouldn't be worth anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that was such a bad thing about my local news agent, but that's the only thing I could actually consume. And, and then, you know, when video games kind of took off, that was, yeah, that was all consuming for me back then. Well, what, what did you refer to it as? Is it, what did you say? It's like a first, like a, is it a first? Uh, th- th- there's a direct edition. Oh, direct edition. Usually, yeah, usually like a comic doesn't have a barcode on the front. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're usually in that slip, yeah. uh, plastic slips or in their backs. But these direct comics, you'll just find them in any news agent. Um, uh, yeah, they're, they're the only ones that I could get a hold of. So the direct yeah. ones, I guess they're more mass produced. Um, yeah, yeah. And cheaper so prints. And I'm, yeah. I'm not sure if they still do them, but. Yeah, that's how it was back then. Yeah. Well, I can definitely remember yeah. sort of coming across comics and I guess it'd be the same sort of deal for me, like going into a news agent and that's pretty much your exposure to whatever's happening. I mean, I, yeah. you know, growing up in the 90s, basketball cards were massive for me. So, you know, the news agent 
if there was no trading card shop in, in the area, you'd go to the newsagent and just cross your fingers that they've got the good packets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I and collected them as well. What was what, what was your brand? Oh, um, I think Upper Deck was probably Upper Deck a big and, thing for me. Um, yeah, yeah. But then and Skybox. I, yeah, Skybox was cool. Um, yeah. And then then some of the ones like Ultra Ultra. Ultra Flare and yeah, and then yeah. they did the Flare ones, which was slightly um, like F L A I R Flare. Um, yeah, yeah. And then there was like the USA editions, and there was sort of those variations. Skybox did some, and Upper Deck did them as well. And it's yeah. just I yeah. I got. I got absolutely obsessed by it and it got to a point where I was still really into it as it started to become unpopular. And yeah. so all of those, you know, sports stores that were also selling trading cards all started just putting out trestle tables full of boxes of cards and just trying to get rid of them. And I was buying boxes of them for like 10, yeah. bu 10 bucks a box. And I was just like, this is amazing. This is like, yeah. oh, I've hit the jackpot, not really understanding that there was zero value left in these cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was super but, cool. But I mean, that was the idea of collecting it, right? It was more the, the collecting, of, uh, collecting of it, finishing a set. Um, there was a really great series of Marvel um, cards, uh, Marvel Universe, I think it was called. Mm. And, uh, yeah, just the artwork on that. Uh, that was probably the most crazy I got about comics was collecting those cards. Uh, Marvel Masterpiece, it was called, yeah. I think I vaguely yeah. remember them. And I think um, I had a few, uh, I had a few, like, I think it was like an X-Men series at one point or something like that that I yeah. that I was collecting. And they were very similar to, like, your, your typical sort of sports trading cards where you had some statistics on the back of, mm, of each yeah, person. Yeah. And I just... Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I've got like this little tinge of analytical sort of personality to myself, but I just, I was obsessed with stats and I could tell you yeah, every, yeah. every weight and yeah. height of every basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. Really useful and, their, information. And, their, and their free throw percentage or yeah. like that's really going to come in handy <laughs> later on in life. But <laughs> you just yeah, no, I would, I've got boxes of it still at my mum and dad's house, you know, oh. it, it's, that was a great thing about growing up in that, that it was not really anything like that. And then, yeah, it was all consuming, and it would have cost us cost my parents a fortune, like when I was twelve. Oh, for sure, for yeah. sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I remember my parents bribing me with basketball cards, so he'd, I would do things like get stuff done. Like I, yeah, I remember yeah. I picked up the trumpet as a kid, and um, and I, I started getting into it a little bit. But then, as most kids, you, you get over things pretty quickly. And my parents bribed me to stick at it for like the remainder of the year or whatever it was. And it, the bribe was something like four packets of basketball cards. And I'm thinking, tight asses in hindsight? Like, that was nothing. <laughs> but um, I remember there, there were like, you know, there was one of the like, I, there might have been the, the first series of like the Upper Deck Collector's Choice. And so they were a little bit yeah. more expensive. And I remember yeah. going, oh, wow, this is really exciting. And so that yeah. was enough so, motivation. I was, I was on. I was playing yeah. trumpet every day. It was great. <laughs> So you've got like four packs every week or? No, it was just four packets and that's it. And I was just like, oh, and I'm for a whole like terms. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. And I, <laughs> you know, dumb kid, I, I fell for it straight away. I was like that, it was that instant gratification, not understanding the long-term commitment that I'd just signed myself up for. But, um, yeah, you yeah. know, it, it, it ended up working out, uh, working out well for everybody. But, um, yeah, I, um, yeah. It was my world for, for quite a few years there. It was just, it was amazing. And it was, as you said, it was a really cool time because, it was like these days it's amazing. You, you've got everything at your fingertips and literally yeah. like any interest, any topic, anything you can access, audio, video, all yeah. different types of entertainment formats. But yeah. back then you were so limited to what you could do and what you could have access to. And so you became so immersed in just like a single thing. You became so obsessed with something and yeah. it was just so much fun. It was just like this little adventure of just, you know, building something, uh, collecting yeah. things, adding to the collection and totally. trading yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. As the second that something's free, it's kind of, you, you do question its value, oh, but the sure. fact that you were dropping like four or five dollars on a pack of cards and you didn't know what was in it, which was the other exciting part. Oh, absolutely. It was really like a crazy marketing Thing that actually just took off and really works. I yeah. can't believe it stopped. Actually, well, it's I think when like weird. sports kind of goes down, like when basketball was less popular, or like when Jordan wasn't playing anymore, then maybe it kind of does take a. It gets less less popular, and yeah, it's very odd. But it's, it was so so fun back then. It was like really protective of them and wanted to protect them with all those you know slips and yeah. Uh, they, they did a really great series of uh, Marvel cards where they were called holograms and you could uh, like actually see into the image. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Oh, cool. That was great.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you, do you still play the trumpet? Um, no, I don't. I've got it sitting yeah. in a in a case somewhere. Um, yeah. And funnily enough, it I think it's at my parents' place. After all those yeah. years, it's it's just it never, <laughs> yeah. it never left their never left their house. But um, I yeah. can I think if I could pick it up, I would be able to remember a couple of a couple yeah. of tunes like New York, New York, or something like that. But um, all right. I'd have some flashbacks to to primary school and some traumatic combined school orchestras <laughs> and things like that. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it sort of. Um, it at the time was quite quite a painful experience, but um, just because you know I was getting challenged and like anything, it's growing pains and trying to work yourself out. But um, in hindsight, yeah. it it set me up really well for for music and sort of the having music, a bit yeah. of an ear for for things and picking up other yeah. stuff. So it's been been quite yeah. good. But um, yeah, I've, I've always like every once in a while I have this thought and I'll go, yeah, I probably should like probably should grab it and just like have a go and just see if I could like get into it. Maybe I can make like trumpet really cool, like in yeah, like yeah. Met, metals picked up trumpet in the in the last ten oh, years. Really? Every once in a while, you'll like I remember Megadeth did an album like ages ago, and um and they were ranting and raving like pre-release and they're doing the promo for it. I can't remember what album. And they're like, oh, this one song's got trumpet in it, and everyone was freaking out. And I heard it, and it was literally like. Yeah two notes in a song oh, right. and it was just like totally over exaggerated yeah but, um yeah. yeah i think um <laughs> i think like i don't know much about i haven't listened to much of ghost but i think ghost have saxophones or that in their last album they had some saxophone okay. and stuff like that so yeah yeah yep. they're a bit more experimental these days yeah well do, do you feel like you'd ever introduce that to to lord oh i might i might have a might have a tough battle ahead trying, <laughs> yeah especially if you try and drop like New York, New York into the next metal song yeah. you guys record. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Maybe, maybe yeah. this weird sort of fade in, fade out. It can come from a, a scene that's set to begin with yeah. and then it kicks into yeah. the song. Maybe, yeah, maybe I could do yeah. that. Metallica, no, Metallica's on for Gibbons already done that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. okay, all right. Yeah. Mm. All right, the, the, the cogs are turning. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. And if you want to finish your basketball set, you'll have to go back home and – Start playing trumpet again. Oh man, that's, your basketball card that, that's exactly right. Yeah, mum oh. and dad, find me some cards. Yeah, yeah. bribe me. Oh, yeah, man. but I mean, with on the top, and I won't make this podcast all about trading cards. But um, yeah, yeah, I, I do, I do get on a roll with this stuff. But um, what I did find in recent years is I ended up bringing them all with me. And so I don't think there's much left at my parents' place, but um, I've got them all packed away and they're all in the folders and they're all neatly sort of stored. Yeah. And, and I just cross my fingers that one day they might be worth something. But I yeah. I was so obsessed that I, when, as I said before, I was buying like all these sets and boxes, boxes of unopened cards when they were starting to go out of fashion and becoming yeah. very cheap. So when I was like going through a lot of my stuff in storage, I had boxes and boxes of doubles, like just so many doubles. And they weren't like doubles of like nice insert cards, high value cards. They were just like, just the, the most useless cards that just there yeah. was 50 million copies of the one card printed of a player that only played for like half a season and then disappeared. And yeah, yeah. so what I did was I pulled them all out and I've put them into a box and I've got them in my cupboard here in the office. And, um, I send out a lot of orders for the band and I also sell some stuff online, like, um, you know, music stuff and everything. So every time I send out an order, I chuck a random yep. basketball card in there. And <laughs> yeah, right. it is amazing to hear, like, I get messages from people just going, what the hell? Where did this come from? Oh my God. Like flashback. This is incredible. Yeah. And yep. it's just so cool that like, even though they've got zero value, they've somehow brought some value back. Like it's just yeah, some, yep. something still there. It's just so cool. Yeah, that, that is cool. So that's your thing. That's your signature now. That's it. Yeah, I'm known for yeah. known for sending out useless basketball cards to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get news out of them then. Well, that's that's it. great. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. That's right. I've, uh, <laughs> it, they've been repurposed. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going back to what you said before about the you know with comics and sort of only having access to the news agent. I mean, at that point in time when you were grabbing the odd comic. Um, yeah. did you have that sort of same approach with cards as far as a little bit of a collecting sort of thing, or was it more just a casual interest where you just pick one up and read it and sort of turf it and, and keep going? Uh, yeah, it was more of the casual thing, like picking up and, you know, reading a one-off issue that I like the, the look of the cover or, um, you know, trying to get to as many characters as possible and see what they're all about. Uh, and I didn't really feel like picking up like a Marvel comic back then, you know, you'd be getting into Spider-Man story halfway through, you know. Uh, but when Image came out, uh, Image Comics in 1991, oh, yeah. uh, I think it was 91, and uh, you were like, 
these are brand new comics and they're like, this is the first issue and you feel like that's kind of special as well. Uh, so some of those were, you know, the Spawn comics, uh, Savage Dragon. Um, yeah, that was just, you know, it was totally excess though. You know, it was there were characters were so over designed. They had spikes and chains and, you know, big flowing capes and, uh, you, you know, 11 year old kid gets lost in that kind of world. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, but then there, there were so many other vices back then, like the basketball cards and the, and the video games that, uh, you know, I, I couldn't collect everything. Uh, so yeah, there was video games and basketball cards and yeah, trading cards. Well, um, from a video game sorry. point of view, what, no, that's right. Oh, from a video game point of view, what was, what was some of the early stuff or the stuff that sort of got you hooked? Um, it was mostly, uh, Nintendo in the beginning, uh, the, the Metroid series, um, Oh, yeah. Just because, you know, you do get um, like a, a bit of a story arc uh, where, you know, some of the other games on Sega were a little bit more start to finish. You want to know what happens to this character and in uh, Zelda as well. So when you're playing as Link and you've got to start and to finish, uh, but there's a journey in the middle. Uh, it seemed like even with an 8-bit game, they could still get a story going on uh -huh. uh, Nintendo. But uh, Sega, not so much. It was more... Hey, you're going to walk from left to right, and you're going to fight that guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I, yeah, you do get it engrossed in that kind of world as well. Oh, for sure. And I mean, I um, I had a friend that lived around the corner from me as a kid, and um, I I had an Atari, which was even more basic than everything else that was going on at that time. It was, I think, it was my, one of my parents that owned it or something like that. And um, yeah, so that was kind of cool. But um, a friend around the corner had uh, the original Sega Master System, so. Yeah. It, what you just said then was 100% it. It was like from left to right, jump up and yeah. down, and there was no, there was nothing more to it. It was pretty much just finish the level and yeah. keep going. And there wasn't a lot of sort of, there wasn't a lot of yeah. deep sort of storyline or plot to it. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, I mean, I get that was like, uh, I think where video games could have, like, if they all kept with that kind of, you know, there's no story, it's just a bunch of, you know, sprites moving around. I think video games probably would have had an early, early death there. But yeah, that, that story really got you hooked. Um, just building a world that you could, you know, interact with. I think that was that was the key for video games, and I think that's when it all changed. Uh, there w did come a time in my my early thirties where I was not spending too much time playing video games, but I just kind of turned it off and said, "I'm going to create something. I'm going to create something that other people can consume, and on that that kind of level, and actually, you know, immerse themselves in a world that I want to create." And and that was the comic for me. It was. Um, I kind of just shut everything else out. And I, whenever I was, you know, in the middle of uh, jobs like deadlines for uh, clients, uh, I would put everything else down and just work on that comic. Going back to obviously, you know, as we mentioned earlier, you, you started with the interest of comics being sort of very casual and whatever was available at the time. I mean, yeah. at so what sort of time frame are we looking at where you sort of had this moment or, you know, you started to think about the concept of, hey, that would be a really cool thing to do one day up to yeah. the point where you've sort of got this concept, you know, there's there's a visual or there's something actually coming together. I mean, what sort of time frame yeah. are you looking at? Um, I, I do remember the day. It was like probably the best working day I've ever had in my entire career. Uh, it was about six years ago. Uh, and... Um, I was a new dad. My, my son was about six months old and, you know, he wasn't sleeping. So I wasn't sleeping and I get off the bus on a day, uh, when I was trying to get to work and, uh, I was just like deflated, you know, I, I could barely walk. Um, and whatever song I was listening to at seven thirty in the morning, you know, just wasn't it doing it for me. So I, I put on, uh, Metallica's master of puppets yeah. and, you know, that opening riff with every, you know, hit of the guitar, I was like walking <laughs> upright. Um, I was, you know, my chest was, was that uh you know back my back was you know back was up my shoulders were up and and i was just walking different uh and you know i felt like i was stomping the ground with you know i was with the presence and and uh, i started thinking about what was going on and it was just because of this this song and it wasn't because i had like you know nearly a half liter of coffee and that had nothing to do with it it was this song uh and you know as i was walking it just kept on getting bigger and bigger and you know an overactive you know creative imagination and i just started thinking about this character uh you know taking this this thing that was like an emotional uh impact it was having on me and say what would happen if it was physical if i you know if i did get physically stronger just by listening to this song and uh, I walk through the door of the office and uh, I'm looking at all these sad people and their sad faces having to work another day. 
And I went, you know what? They didn't listen to this song, you know, but I did. So I, I'm going to be able to get through it. Uh, I walked through the, the doors in my office and um, talked to my two colleagues uh, and told them about this idea I had and how I'm going to get through the day just because of this song. And I told them about the superhero. And they looked at me and said, that's the coolest shit I've ever heard. I can't believe no one's done that. And, uh, yeah, from that moment on, I just could not stop thinking about it. Uh, yeah, it was it was crazy. It was probably, yeah, it was down, it was the best day I've ever had working. Um, and I was just scribbling notes all day. Uh, I, I wish I could get that back. And I know that there's, a, there's ideas all the way, you know, there's always going to be ideas that are going to pop up. And, and for me, this one was the most important thing, you know, uh, creatively speaking. Uh, but, yeah, such a, such a great day. I still think about that going, oh, you know, if I could just try and bottle that, I would be a rich person. Oh, like even you retelling it, and, and I've and I've read read the comic as well, and I sort of had a similar feeling sort of reading it and sort of just the moment sort of where you're getting sort of electrified by the music. It's just, you know, just coming to life. And yeah. And you just telling that story sort of makes me think of like I'm I'm starting to think about oh well yeah what what was that moment for me like you know what was that what was those moments where you sort of go whoa and suddenly just life feels a little bit different like there's just something yeah. something yeah. that changes and you can't even put your finger on it. I mean obviously you know that the music's charging you yeah. um but you just can't quite put your finger on exactly what it is or why and yeah. um I mean I just I, I and I've I've said this to to people in the past. So people that are listening to us have a chin wag. will probably have heard the story a million times, but, um, mm -hmm. I, I remember like one of those types of moments where I used to tape rage because I was just either too young or just too tired to stay up late and, and <laughs> yeah, watch, watch yeah. like the four metal clips that were on, you know, a, yeah. on a Saturday night or whatever it was. And yeah, I used to just tape them all and I, I was still discovering music. So I didn't know three quarters of, of the bands and the artists that were on the list. So I'd just sit there yeah. on, on the Sunday morning and just start slowly watching everything and fast forwarding the crap stuff. And, yeah. and I came across some, yeah. um, uh, Iron Maiden fear of the dark live at Donington. And right. I, I remember sitting there and I was cross-legged on the carpet in front of the TV and yeah. I'm just watching and I just couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. I didn't, I didn't understand what I was listening to. I didn't understand yeah. what I was looking at. I couldn't understand yeah. how there were so many people um, and just the, the ambience and, and just the build up, the, you know, the yeah. slow start and then it kicks in and, and I just, and the flags, like everyone's got their flags live at Donington, like everyone's got their, their, the country that they're from and the flags are flying out and the crowd yeah. and yeah. everything. And I just, yeah. That same sort of feeling where you just, just rush this this charge, and I was just like, my God, yeah. like I've never felt anything like this before. Yes. And and um and I think that's why metal. In, I mean, I'm sure people get it from other genres of music as well. But um, uh, I don't know, but, I really but to, don't. But to a point with metal, I think it's yeah. it's just it seems to be on another level. It just seems yeah. to be something that you know it just sparks something incredible in people where you yeah. become ultra passionate about it. Um, yeah. and it becomes more than just, I like that song. There's something yeah. that you, there's a, you identify with it. Um, it, it like, I'll, I'll keep using this term cause I love it. It just, it charges you. It just gets you, yeah. it gets you fired up and it's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, I, I was telling a friend about this and he said, you know, it could only really be metal that the story would work. Uh, and I'd have to agree. Um, but what you were saying before, it was like you, you didn't understand what you were watching, but you, you knew that you liked it. And usually the, your human instinct is to go, I don't understand this, so I'm going to fear it. Mm. And I think, you know, metal really does push people apart and go, if you understand it, you can really like it. But if you don't like it, then you almost fear it. Mm. And uh, when I was doing research for the comic, I was, you know, finding this repeating word poses. Um <laughs> Uh, which you know is is going to come back in uh, in issue two or three, I think. Um, but like just the idea of a, a poser, and I don't know if it was just something that somebody would say to another person just to insult them. And mm. um, but yeah, when when I was doing the research and I was watching like that documentary Paradise Lost about the oh, yeah. the West Memphis, yeah, um, like it was really like that was a scapegoat just as much as what video games are to, mm. to violence. Um, and, you know, at Thrash Metal, when, when I was looking through these photos of Metallica and Slayer back in, like, 1984, it was like they were having the best time. It looked like they were having the best time. I'm not sure if they've had a high like that since those bands uh, from the Thrash Metal uh, genre. 
Um, but I can't imagine what it was like for them. Like it, you're getting that kind of um, inspiration from, you know, watching Iron Maiden when you were, uh, well, what, what age? Oh, um, yeah, probably about, oh, geez, um, maybe 11 or 12, maybe. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I've heard that a lot from people that like heavy music is that, that metal moment where, you know, you are a 12-year-old kid. Uh, for me, it was uh, watching Faith No More's Epic and oh, yeah. just not understanding what's going on but loving it. Um, yeah, it's such a such a great thing to hear that from people as well because you know that once you got had that moment, you're, you're hooked. Uh, is is it different when you're like if you're playing for in Lord? Uh, if you start a tour, is like the first show exactly the same as the last show, or do you kind of get burnt out on it? No, no, that's not the right question because you want people to come to Lord shows and see you like you're playing. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, whatever you do, no. don't come to the first show. Come to the last show. Yeah, come versa. to the last show. No, yeah, I know uh, what you mean. But though. I'm, yeah, is it uh, is it the same? Do you kind of get that same you know kick out of it after you've been doing it for however many years? Um, I think so. I guess it's quite timely, really, because I mean, we haven't played. We only played two shows last year, and and that was after a long break. And um, those shows for us probably were more painful than exciting because there was just a lot going against us uh, for a right. lot, of, lot of different reasons. Just um, time, um, getting things together, it, yeah, dusting yeah. the cobwebs for for all of us, and we we yeah. got it over the line and we had fun. But um, there was, a, I guess, a lot of pressure leading into it. And now, like we're we're going to do an Australian tour uh, mm. at the end of June, and it's only just a small run of shows around the country. But um, yeah, I'm quite excited for it because we'll have a new album, we'll have a product. We've there's a purpose of going out there. We're not there's a purpose for it. Yeah. 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 And so it's, it's kind of like, you know, some of the things that you've been saying, it's, it's that storyline. There's a narrative attached to it. I can, I can put a little bit of a journey to it. It's not just these random shows that we're playing. So for yeah. me, there's yeah. sort of like, there is a begin a beginning, middle and end to, to a point. And so yeah. that first and show. You're, and you're playing new songs as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So there's, there's new things to share with people and, and for us on stage, there's going to be, I think there's going to be a little bit of, a little bit of nerves from us because it'll be a while since we've played and there's going to be mm -hmm. new stuff as well. Um, yeah. but I think a, a big charge from that, a big a, a charge again, um, a big, yeah. uh, a fair bit of excitement around it is going to be like we're back and people get to see us again. There's a lot of people have been waiting for us to play again, but also we've got something to share. We've got something exciting. We can't wait to share it with you. And so yeah, yeah. that will sort of override any of the nerves that we have. But I think yeah. from a, from a purely sort of mechanical point of view of, of getting on stage and playing um, generally what we find, or at least from my point of view, I think the guys agree usually towards the end of those run, that run of shows is when you really start to, you go to another level. Are you, mm. it's, it's that, it's that flow state sort of feeling. It's that you're so locked in with everybody else where it's almost yeah. this telepathic sort of understanding of cues and things like that. And even stuff where people start to get a little bit, um, a little bit too tricky for their own good and start to just change things up here and there. But sometimes, right. but somehow we manage just to cling on and just make it work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that usually comes further on into a tour and, um, okay. and they're amazing feelings. So usually yeah. to start off with, we're, we're a little bit, I wouldn't say rusty, but we're, we're probably just a little bit, um, more rigid to begin with because we're like, Oh, okay. Oh, how's this go again? Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. This is fun. Yeah. And this is a bit of a novelty. And then after that, it's like, yeah, all right, we're on. Let's let's yeah, do this. Yeah, yeah. And, and you you like that word charge because you know that's what the the comic is about. Do you do you get that when you're on stage? Is, is it like there's Andy podcast Andy, but then there's Andy <laughs> stage Andy? <laughs> yeah, the characters come out. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, you certainly, um, you certainly get into these moments where you're you're completely. It's it's weird because. Part, part of me would say that I'm completely in the moment of being the person on stage and putting on a show, but part of it is that I'm not like, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and if I'm, if I'm too aware of what's going on, then that's when I'm, yeah. I, I play yeah. a bung note or something like that. Yeah. Right. Um, but um, I definitely, I definitely I, get on stage with a character, like not a character, but I, I, um, you lose your inhibitions. Yeah, yeah, and you okay. lose your inhibitions. Like you, you sort of, yeah. you put on a show, you, you run around like an idiot, you, you got big smiles and, and a lot of things that I might not normally do just yeah. in everyday conversation, <laughs> yeah. interaction yeah. with people. Yeah. So that 
I mean, that, that's why the, I think the character does work because there is this this Maurice when he's not listening to to metal, his his body language, you know, shows how vulnerable he is, and you know that he is a bit of a loner. Uh, but then when he's listening to music, he's he is he's upright. You know, he's he doesn't physically change, but his his body posture does. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I love hearing that. That's that's fantastic. I mean, I wish I could get on a drum kit and play in a metal band. I've got a, a little digital, you know, uh, Roland kit here, and uh, I just think way too much. I can't stop it. Uh, <laughs> and some of the advice I've been getting from drummers is, you know, just if you think about what's coming up next, you're going to mess up what you're playing yeah. now. Yeah, and I can't disconnect that. Um, and for me, it, it's more of a, a, a you know, the, the release of just making noise. Um, do you... Uh, I had a, like I had a bunch of questions to ask just because I want to do research for the next book. Yeah, do it. Yeah, um, if you're in a band, and like you might have to answer this as Andy and Lord, but then maybe think about what it would be like as 1985 thrash metal scene. Yeah. Um, but if somebody, if you're in a metal band, can you like things out of sight of your own genre back then, Ooh. or would that be considered a poser type move? Well. I mean, I, I guess, like, so Tim in our band is, I was going to say, considerably older than us, which is so harsh on Tim. But he's, look, he's older than, he's definitely older than I am. And um, yeah. and so he... You can edit that bit out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, like, we, like, he, he definitely grew up in this in this era. And, um, and a really cool thing, actually, all right, I'll, this is... I'll, I'll tie this into a bit of new album talk as well. So... Yeah, um, cool. And this might help you as well with a bit of context. So... The new album that we've we've finished and will come out soon is called Fallen Idols, and it is um, it's an album that doesn't necessarily have a theme as such. But it what we've been known for over the past several years is that we haven't tried to pigeonhole ourselves too much. People will say if they hear of us, they go, "Oh, that's the power metal band" or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if people they're really familiar with our stuff, we we have uh, thrash metal, power metal, classic metal. We've also got like bits of melodic death metal in there. We've got some, mm. bl we've got blast beats. We've got some black yeah. metal stuff. And, but somehow we mash it all together and it just, it's just a metal song. And, yeah. and yeah. with this album, we sort of had this, uh, this sort of goal that we were just going to put in everything that we absolutely loved about metal and even rock. There's some AOR stuff in there as well. Some like power ballad okay. sort of uh, esque yeah. stuff yep. as well. Um, because, and this is, uh, where Tim sort of comes into it when he was growing up and he grew up in Broken Hill and there was a big sort of rival scene between the punks and the metalheads. And so they would, they would have like literal fights. So they get drunk and just, they go after each other and, and all this sort of stuff. And it sounded, yeah. it sounds slightly over dramatized, but when we went out there and played shows in Broken Hill, we met a lot of his friends from his childhood. We realized that, um, no, these stories seem to add up. Like there, there's some, yeah. there was some pretty pretty hairy stuff that used to happen. I guess when you when you're bored and you've got nothing to do in the middle of nowhere and you've got alcohol, yeah. then things get crazy. Yeah. But yeah. Um, they also would have these house parties, and so they would have their their stereo there with cassettes or whatever, and they would have mixtapes, and mm. the mixtapes would have everything from. Uh, creator and Slayer to Bon Jovi, Dokken, Queensryche, and then it would flip over to Bathory, and the and so you would have this really weird mix of all this stuff. But for them, yeah. it was just it was just all metal. It was yeah, just, it yeah. was just it was just all metal. Um, yeah. And so we sort of took that concept and thought, with our album, it's mm. all metal, no matter what. And yeah, so yeah. it's a very long way of answering this question, but I think I think there's an element of I think if there's if there's hard guitars and there's there's an element of a metal sort of attitude to it or a metal sort of um, uh, way of thinking, I'm trying to think of the right word behind it, but um, you know, there's there's the so that mental approach to the music where you can identify with it, then I think people are far more relaxed to it. Yeah, I think yeah. even probably in the eighties, um, I don't think people would have necessarily been one hundred percent thrash metal and that's it, nothing else. Um, right. But yep. if it was too soft or it was too pop, um, yep. then it might be a different story. And I certainly remember um, 
you know, stories like Metallica, like Metallica was, I think there was a thing where they were talking about Motley Crue and they said like something about, about them being a bunch of girls or something like that, mm, you know, because yeah, they all yeah. had the big hair and the makeup and everything. Yeah, um, yeah. And so there was definitely a bit of friction between like the thrash metal scene and the glam scene that was, that was yeah. rising up in the eighties. Yeah. So, yeah. um, it, it's probably a bit of both really. I mean, probably a very, yeah. very confusing answer to give, but, um, yeah, it's, it's I, I remember, um, James Hetfield, I think it was like before the Black Album album came out, mm. self title, and, uh, and you know he said there were like fans that were there for uh, you know Master of Puppets and uh, that era, the Ride the Lightning, and uh, and you know that their, their, their older fans were going, you guys are on radio now, you guys suck, <laughs> you know where's our Metallica, you know we made you, we lifted you up, or you know I'm paraphrasing there, obviously, but yeah. uh, yeah, like they they really hated the fact that it was other people's music now, not just that scene. Yeah, 100%. yeah, and and I think a big thing with that is, and this comes back into that whole um, sort of the mindset or the lifestyle around being being identified as a metalhead, um, yeah, which is which becomes more than the music, and I think it's always been that. You know, the scapegoat sort of thing as we've been speaking about and the stereotypes mm. and always being sort of against the grain, you know, these yeah. they're 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 very much cliches these days, but there's truth behind them. And, you know, all yeah. of us growing up, especially when we started telling other people we we liked, you know, heavy music or metal or something like that, you would have yeah. either a parent or a grandparent or an auntie or you know, a, yeah. a work colleague or something, they're like, uh, yeah, all right, that um that head banging music or that devil music or whatever. Yeah. It is. Devil music. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. but you kind of fed off that, like you, you want to be yes, you yeah. want people to hate it yeah. because yeah. that made it even better. And there's a, there's a real thrill about being rebellious as well and having your own thing yeah. that you could say that you're a part of. And so when those people yeah. that you'd normally have that divide with started to go, Hey, this is all right. It's sort of like yeah. when your parents suddenly say that something that you like is cool and you're like, whoa, 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 hang on. <laughs> yeah, that kind of ruins it. I huh? don't think I can like this anymore. <laughs> what you're, you're, you're stepping on my territory here. And I think yeah. that's where a lot of it comes from, where you take so, yeah. so much pride in it. It's very territorial. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, that, that was why the question is, like even in a, a subgenre or even a, a sub subgenre of heavy music. And then uh, I don't know if they, they ever mixed, but I know that, you know, the punks and the metalheads never, never got on. Um, and that, that is the basis for the comic as well. Uh, I, you know, I was writing notes about this, this character and, and a lot of it was, um, it was based on, I can't remember what documentary I was watching, but, uh, there was all these thrash metal bands and metal bands going, you know, what happened to heavier music when, uh, the grunge was like the grunge era was mm -hmm. kind of taken off and, you know, a whole, you know, sub genre of music was just boiled down to those four bands. Uh, which I, I felt was like that's pretty unfair that you know Exodus might be just out there on the uh, the out, outer skirts of thrash metal and you know I'm not sure if they're still doing anything but I wouldn't want to be in Exodus knowing that I can't even be you know, like counted in the top five thrash metal bands. Um, well, yeah, yeah, and I, I think I mean especially sort of going into the nineties. I mean, the nineties was so tough for so many metal bands and there was really only a, a small amount those, obviously those top tier bands that sort of held it together and, mm. and had success. And some of those bands had to actually pivot and change their sound um, yeah, to yep. try and stay relevant. And I don't know if that was a complete strategy on their behalf, but they sort of went in that direction. And yeah. then you had bands like Pantera that just sort of came out of this glam world. I mean, they, they had this whole glam era, era and then they changed their sound and just became this this behemoth of a, of a band that just took over everything in the 90s and they were just absolutely yeah. spectacular. And so, yeah. but for a lot of bands, they just, it it got quiet. It got really yeah. quiet for a lot of bands. Yeah. And, um, and now, like, where it stands in the last sort of 10, 15 years into the 2000s, it's... Um, metal's come back massive especially in europe and it has yeah and um, yeah. a lot of these bands are suddenly you know knocks are at the door again and they're like oh like you know we yeah we, people we, want to see you again yeah that's yeah. it and they become better yeah. than what they were you know in in the 80s for some of them yeah yeah well i mean that, that's uh you know every hero needs something to fight for and maurice is just fighting for for metal uh so in a, like an alternate reality where you know grunge stays where it it was and metal just keeps on keeps on going, so he's protecting it from other genres. Purely, you know, selfish because that's what I wanted to see. But <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and like I, I'd never written anything before besides maybe a couple of um, 
uh, game reviews back in the day for a street press in, here in Brisbane. Mm. Um, but uh, when I was making all these notes on that that first night, uh, it was I, I looked back on it now, and somebody said, "You know, you followed the hero's, hero's journey. Mm. You know that 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 arc and that that coming back all the way around." Uh, I followed it till T, and I didn't even know. Um, when when you see when you see uh, the audience like reacting to a song that you have personally you know written, um, what's that like? Can you can you go through that? If you see somebody singing your lyrics, do you write lyrics for Lord? Um, I have in the past. Um, I've I've done little bits and pieces here and there. Um, and yeah. um, it's kind of it is kind of surreal. Um, and it's hard. It's 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 definitely different these days because. I think we've done it for quite a few years and you sort of, I think un unfairly, um, you take it for granted sometimes. Um, yeah. But okay. I still have those moments where we're playing something and you look out and somebody is just mouthing the words to a T. They've got like, it's not just, I'm just going to try and mouth and just sing along. And this is a bit of fun. Like you're watching somebody and they're like, they're, they're sort of frowning with concentration with, but with so much intensity and passion that they're yeah. like singing these yeah. words. And you just sort of look and go like, like you always go, geez, mate, like, what the hell? You're right. Like, get <laughs> yeah. into it. And then you sort of think, wow, yeah. like, because you did that. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, yeah. we, we, we write this music and we, we record it and we, 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 we sort of throw ideas backwards and forwards and we compile it and eventually release it. But, mm. and when it goes out there, especially with the internet now, you sort of put it out there and, you know, you get your little likes and your love hearts and, and comments and things like that. And there's little bits of internet validation, but yeah, when, yep. when you're there and you sort of get that energy from somebody in front of you and it's sort of like, Oh wow. Like this, this, there's, there's actually real people out there. It's not just like, these, yeah, not these, just little love hearts. No, not stuff. just yeah. little love hearts yeah. or, or thumbs up or thing. Yeah, or whatever. Up. yeah. And yeah. it's, um, can in, you imagine if that's what it was like though? Like if you were in like a real life situation and people just put their, their thumb up and like, yeah, <laughs> you guys, are, we like you. And that's as much as you're going to get. It, it's kind of like the, um, when people write LOL, and then yeah. they're actually laughing out loud at all. They're just at like, all. Yeah, yeah. There's not even like a smirk <laughs> on their face. It's just like, yeah. but yep. I'm thinking it. And they're just like standing there with their thumbs up. No, no expression whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ultra weird. Ultra weird. Yeah. Like, that could be in some like yep. weird parallel universe that you could tap into. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yep. But, but yeah, it's, it's just uh, a static profile photo. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. yeah. But um, going back to what you said, I, I have definitely had those moments. And I think, um, especially when we first started playing as as we are as, as Lord, um, especially when we got, we got some bigger opportunities to play bigger shows. So where we would support a larger band. And so you'd play in front of a larger audience where you don't really know how you're going to go. Like there's, yeah. um, you've got a crowd there where for the most part, the a large majority of that crowd don't care about you, um, are there for the headliner and have probably never heard of you. And so you, right. you, you walk out and you've got this, you know, somewhat polite sort of, you know, applaud and applause yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and you start and it's like, all right, well, we've got some work to do here. Like we're, we've, we've, we've got a, we've got a set here. We've got, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or whatever it is. And, um, yeah. and our goal here is to energize the crowd, you know, and to try and win people over and, yeah. and to watch people, watch people's eyes sort of light up and yep. go, oh shit, like, oh wow. Like, and you, and look, they're, they're, they're turning to their mate, like sort of raising their eyebrows going, oh geez, like they're, they're better than I thought. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. I, when I notice those sort of things, it's just like, wow, like this is, this is what the impact is. This is sort of like when I've heard a band that I've liked and, and so the first time. Yeah, yeah. And I've gone, oh, yeah. oh geez, yeah. like, wow, this is really good. And yeah. you're watching people sort of go through those moments. And now like years later, I'll bump into these people at a show and they will retell me stories when they saw us play at a venue for the first time yeah, wow. and, and had no idea who we were and just tell us these amazing stories of how much they were impacted by it. And that is yeah. kind of weird. It's very weird. It's very surreal. And but it's exciting, right? Just so you know uh, that yeah. it's the first time they're hearing Lord. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's incredible because you, at least, I mean, I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, I've spoken about this quite a bit on the podcast with people about sort of our culture here in Australia, where, you know, a bit of the tall poppy syndrome sort of thing, that uh, self-deprecating mm -hmm. humor that we have, where yep. we sort of, yep. we talk ourselves down and we're, we're, we're somewhat humble in, in our own sort of unique way. And yep. um, I think our f default is to sort of 
talk things down or to dull things down a little bit. And so I think subconsciously we sort of tell ourselves that, you know, oh yeah, people probably like us. Oh yeah, I think, yeah, no, we've, got a few, we've got a few people that follow us and listen to our music and everything like that. Yeah. And then you yeah. have these encounters with people and and sometimes, you know, you, you'll see them on the street in the middle of the day and, and, and it's a really, really cool chat and you really enjoy it. Or it's three o'clock in the morning when somebody's absolutely sloshed and they've, mm-hmm. had, they've been drinking for the last 12 hours and they're going to tell you their life story. But yes. both yeah. of them are just as intense in their own way. And, you, yeah. and you're standing there and you're just going, oh, wow, like okay, this is not just, oh, yeah, they kind of like us or whatever. Like, there's yeah, some people yeah. that really, really like what we do and they, they love it. Yeah. And 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 I try not – and I I still try not to sit in that thought for too long. Um, yeah. But it's it's a very surreal feeling. And it's funny that you're, you're asking these types of questions because I don't often think about it either. Um I think. All right. Sorry. No, no, it's, 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 no, it's really, it's, it's, it's good. Like it's good. Um, because I yeah. just, I think like many of us, like no matter what we do, whether we're you know, playing music or doing creative endeavors or just day to day, we're, we're sort of yeah. looking at the next task at hand, you know, we're moving forward yeah. and we're trying to, yeah. we're trying to master whatever the next thing is, the next challenge. And so we don't, yeah. we don't stop. And that's a yeah. big thing that I've tried to do quite a bit. So you've kind of, um, forced me into this uh this retrospective sort of reflective thinking and it's, no and it's it's actually yeah. it's actually it's, these are the things that i need so uh, thank yeah. you for the therapy well, session uh, <laughs> you're really welcome uh well because i'm i'm mean, going through the this well i'm not the same thing because it's you know different mediums but mm. um where i've had like such a, a great it, it has been like me and uh jesse ham who did the illustrations mm. um it's been me and him working on it, but, uh, well, my project, cause he was commissioned. Uh, but then having like a support crew around me, uh, like just getting feedback and, you know, you know, willing to take on some and, you know, let other ones go or, uh, but outside of my circle, like where uh, a stranger might give, give me feedback on the comic. Um, and I'm not discrediting my, my friends or, or anything and all that close support crew. Cause they have been amazing, you know, just, that bouncing ideas and, you know, um, getting that like kind of motivation, you know, that, that push. Uh, but when, when a stranger does go, I love that. I, I, I want to know what happens next. You have to get the next one out. And, uh, when, when a stranger does it, it's like, they're not, they're not obliged to do it. And I know friends aren't obliged to do it, but, uh, when, when you see like a friend of mine, uh, you know, I gave him a copy of the comic and, he came back to me and said, my entire family read that. That's cool. I went, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've never had to, you know, push anything on social media before or had to, to market things, personal projects. I've done marketing because, you know, publishing, but mm. never, never my own thing. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that people like it. Uh, I hope that I, but at this stage for me, it was more about that feedback and, you know, what better way for a band like you, uh, like Lord to to play in front of strangers and then get that instant instant you know gratification of just seeing somebody understand you straight away. Yeah, and and to, it, just to un, just to get the validation that you know it's not just your inner circle, it's not just your comfort mm. zone where yeah. you know people. And I, I get what you're saying where you know it's not necessarily that they feel obliged, but they're yeah. You've, there's this bias there. There's, there's there's bias where people will default to support and and say nice things, and not because it's they feel that they're obliged. It's just a default. It's a natural thing because we've got yeah. existing yeah. connections and and a relationship there. And um, yeah, and that's and that's fantastic. It's great to have great to have that kind of stuff. But um, I agree. Like you know, when you're in an environment where uh, people have zero connection with you, zero bias, uh, or anything as such. And they respond in a very similar way or in their own yeah. unique way that's positive. Then that's, it's quite an eye opener. It's, it's yeah. very yeah. surreal. And it's, it's a shock to the system. If you, if you've never sort of experienced it and you sort yeah. of go, yeah. Oh, wow. Like I've never, I've never, I never sort of had this feeling before. I've never sort of, cause I think, I think a lot of people out there sort of, you grow up and you have your, your, your circles of friends and, and your family. And, and even mm-hmm. when you sort of leave school and you get into the workforce and you have a career, 
and you know might settle down, have a family, etc. You tend to have your little community of whoever that is, and they usually come from those different environments, whether it be work or family yeah. or just very close friends, people that you may have, may have hung on to from school. Um, yeah. And for a lot of people, I think it's changing a bit now with the internet, but I think most people have sort of got a very small community of people and they're very satisfied with that. And so yeah. they don't really find themselves in situations with a lot of strangers and getting some form of feedback. Um, mm. So it's, it's a very, very unusual feeling. Yeah. I, I sat through, um, uh, there was this, uh, this podcast called the awesome comics podcast. And mm. uh, a friend of mine told me that they, they featured uh, my comic on it. And oh, wow. as I was listening to it, I was, I was shaking. Like I didn't know how <laughs> anybody's going to receive it. Uh, and, you know, having said that, uh, the, the circle that I do have around me, there, there are a lot of uh, creative people in there. So mm. it's never just, hey, way to go. You made a book. It's constructive. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's great to have that, that as well. I mean, other, otherwise I don't think, no, I, I probably still would have done it. I just don't think the comic book would be as good if, if it didn't have that kind of feedback. Because um, a lot of people that are in bands say it's like a family. Is that true? Or is it like a, do you kind of pair up with another member of the band and, uh, you have like a similar train of thought with it and there's like, there's this divide then, or um, it's like each, each person gets their own, you know, voice, uh, share a voice or, uh, you know, just cause I, I'm not, I'm not there. Um, and I've worked in creative groups before, but usually one person's got their own thing. You know, you're either production or you're editorial and you're working together and you're making that work. Uh, but with a, a band, in particular, like, like one that maybe if it is a prog band, uh, that, you know, a song can go on how many different tangents and, you know, who has that say and, um, like, is it like a shared? I mean, I guess it's subjective from band to band, but hmm. for you personally. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I've always used the running joke with people when I talk about playing in a band, I say it's like having three other girlfriends except for the sex, you know, really. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's fights, it's it's close bonds it's yeah. having each other's backs but a lot of friction a lot of tension at times and a lot of um competitive sort of behavior at times as well and it's yeah. just a bit of everything and and it's almost like a family sort of setting as well where every family no matter how amazing it looks on the outside is yeah, somewhat there's, dysfunctional there's yes. there's something that's just not there's elements that are just not perfect and and we're no yeah. exception to that and i think um depending on the album, depending on the song, depending on yeah. the, the plan that's in place or what we're about to do. Um, mm. It might be more of a, a, a collaboration with, with everybody and everybody's putting in input. And sometimes people have just got an idea and, and, and they're sort of, they're going to run, run with it. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to follow along and see what, what comes of it. And, um, yeah. and it does come down and it's changed. I mean, we've had so many different sort of scenarios over the years and we've had some really testing times where we've mm -hmm. um, really butted heads where you know all i think all of us in the band have have had moments where we've considered whether we should be uh, still playing in the band or not and and just yeah. really highly emotional moments along the way and then you sort of realize like you know i mean i've got a brother and you know we you know we fight and then we get along mm. and then we fight and we get along and it was, it was yeah. worse when you're kids yeah. as well. But, um, it's same, yeah. it's the same sort of thing, you know, and you just, I think yeah. there's an underlying level of respect that we have for each other where we know yeah. sort of where our limit limits are and we know when and when not to push. Um, but we yeah. also know when to take advantage of that as well. When people get a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit, um, you know, worked up and, and want to try and throw their weight around, but we know how to, yeah. we, we relatively know how to manage each other. So it's, um, it is a family, a family sort of vibe, but um, but in a very sort of realistic, dysfunctional sense, like like a mm -hmm. lot of families are. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, yeah, I was like the idea of um, like Maurice because he's the drummer of, of the band that he's in. Um, like the other three um, members of the band, like kind of treat him like he is on the outer, uh, and Maurice is kind of like uh, oblivious to the fact. But uh, the other three are always together. Uh, and you know, they never help him pack, uh, the drum kit away. <laughs> um, and it, uh, that's one of the questions was, uh, you know, if, when you were like, when did you start playing uh, music in a band, Andy? Ooh. Well, um, at what age? 
I like okay. So first proper band wasn't until quite late. I think it was. I think I was actually eighteen. Um, but oh, okay. um, but I think like I was playing these sort of really just. I barely called a band with friends in sort of mid high school where I was playing guitar. Um, mm. And it was barely trying to get through a single song, let alone being able to write anything or do anything or actually perform yeah. in front of anybody. Um, but yeah, right. around, around 18 was sort of when I started actually playing with, um, you know, like a proper band that sort of semi had their stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine that like it, it was exciting back then, even like only knowing a couple of chords or, you know, a couple of riffs. Um, but yeah, for, for Maurice, they're still in that, that early stages, even though they're kind of, can they're you know they're content with what they do like they don't want to get any better they just want people to listen to it they just want to make noise and i i quite like that you know that's why i've got a drum kit in my 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 bedroom here um but this this band don't really want to go anywhere their level of success is is quite low and um uh when i was like coming up with the concept and uh not knowing it at the time that that hero's journey um the the next one of the next issues uh the hero has to like sacrifice something mm. and like the hardest thing for him to sacrifice is, is the drum kit. Uh, so at, at one point he's going to be trying to play in a band and every time he plays metal, he gets too strong and just destroys every kid he ever plays. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, uh, after reading this first issue, I hope that people can see that there is this little world that's starting to develop. Um, uh, there's, there's all these, like what like you say, there's those, those in things where you can't wear uh, a metal band shirt to that band's, gig uh there's all these little things that a lot of people don't don't know if you're on the outside mm. um or, or we'll get it as like that's a uh, that's an in joke that that's for me so i can take personal uh, appreciation of that um <clears throat> but uh like there are so many little things that i've like developed in these notes and having the first issue just be an origin story there's uh, like there's issues coming that you know i really can't wait to get to that point where you know he's uh, you know, having to wind a Walkman on with a pencil or, um, you know, um, you know, destroying the kit because he's got that strength or um, like just so many things that I can't wait to get to, to actually tell the story because that, that metal like genre is, is kind of, it's uh, circular, you know, um, once you're in it, you, you get to see these things. Uh, and when you're on the outside, yeah, um, they might seem a little bit crazy. Well, I think, um, I think a big thing really, I mean, really quickly with, with a lot of this stuff and even with you sort of asking me these questions and it's sort of making mm. me sort of think bigger picture and reflect and sort of look at sort of what's happened over the years is that a, a great thing, well, it's good and bad and um, is nostalgia. So nostalgia can be a really sort of toxic thing because people just stay in the past and they refuse to change and they're not flexible in their, in their way of thinking, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah. but it's also just a, it's a very intoxicating and a real sort of amazing, uh, sort of feeling to have when you suddenly click with something that comes from the past where you have a rush of emotions and you remember all these things. And mm. that's, it's a very cool thing. And it's also a thing that holds metal back at times where, um, especially with the changes of industry and a lot of metal musicians in particular, or even fans um, have been yeah. quite stubborn um, because they've been stuck in the past and they want the glory days to still happen now. And it unfortunately just doesn't always. Pan out like that. No, yeah. but, yeah. Um, but like even sort of in this first edition and some of the, so the, the things that you're telling me now, as far as what the, the next edition is going to look like and some of the things that you th put in there, they're little tips of the hat back to things that we're going to remember when we grew up and yeah, we yeah. loved and, and that's going to strike a chord. And so I think when you're talking about trying to find that balance, I mean, I, I definitely can't comment on behalf of the comic world because I've got no clue. Um, but <laughs> from a metal point of view, I think if you're able to, tick those boxes as far as putting the little the little easter eggs in there the little references and sometimes the things that if you're not a metal fan you're not going to get or you're not going to or it's going to go over your head but the metal head's yeah. going to go oh yes absolutely then yeah. that's that's what you want because people are yeah. going to really connect with it it's going to be relatable and people will start to be ultra nostalgic and then mm -hmm. that's when they become loyal to what's in front of them being yeah. your series yeah, yeah. 
I mean, and, and no, I've you know, never been in a band, uh, so that's good a good opportunity to get a uh, get a chance to chat to, to someone like you who's, who's been there. Uh, when you emailed me, I went. You know, I haven't uh, been out to a lot of shows, uh, and I started doing research on on Lord, and then uh, read the Wikipedia page. Apologies yeah. on uh, Dungeon, <laughs> yeah. and uh, it, it, that as far as like uh, you know that story, um, like Dungeon had like a, a you know like a crazy past. Mm. Um, you know, offers from, you know, major record labels and tools with Megadeth and, uh, like band mates dropping in and out. Like there's, that's a, it's a fantastic story. I know at the time it probably wouldn't have been great for the band members, but, um, you know, there's, there's, there's drama there. There's, there's, uh, resolve. There's, you know, those, it's pretty much like the life of a metal band is like a, a song from start to finish. Like it, it picks up, it gets heavier, it gets, it drops, it goes back up, it gets, there's a breakdown, you know, there's, uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I, there's nothing I don't like about metal. Um, there are some genres where I'll go, you know what, I could probably listen to that for a half an hour and then, uh, you know, it's just a little bit too much. I think, um, I think there's a real nerd element to, to metal. I think yeah. like as far as I think us as fans of, of metal music, we want to know mm-hmm everything about it like we want yeah we want to know we, we read the liner notes like i mean i'm sure yeah. you're the same when you first started yeah. getting like cds or, or records yeah. or whatever and you could only afford one you know when they were all 30 or 35 bucks a pop and so you would yeah. sit there and you would sit in front of the stereo and you would just read the liner notes you'd read the thanks list you would read the lyrics yeah. and you'd see who wrote what and where it was recorded yeah. And you start yeah. to get this narrative together, and you're like, "Oh wow! Like, what happened? Like, where were they? Oh, they know that. They know that person. Oh, they know that band. They must be friends. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's really cool." Yeah. And and so you start following the journey, and you become really. And this is another reason why people get so passionate about a band, because they're just learning so much about them, and you get little bits and pieces from interviews. People drop little references here and there, and you start to paint this picture. And um, yeah, and I mean, just to touch on that that dungeon sort of stuff. I mean it's it's very similar to a lot of other bands um especially in australia where um it it has been in the past very very hard for australian bands to 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 get ahead because the opportunities were fewer um it was yeah. expensive and and hard to get overseas and yeah um there wasn't a lot of, yeah there wasn't a lot of opportunities to, to, to really find success locally and so yeah you would have people come and go you would have um a lot of a lot of emotion attached to it because some people would be in it f- until the bitter end and if mm. the rest of the band weren't on the same page then there was friction you're messing with my dream and things like that yeah yeah and that was it was a common theme i mean a lot of a lot of bands who have sort of reformed and come back and I've got a lot of friends that have been playing since, you know, the early nineties and you talk to some of those guys and they just, they, they have very similar stories in a way. And, mm. it's, but it's, and I think that's what sort of connects people as well is that it's very relatable. Um, yeah. It's, it's is, is one of the issues that uh, Australia is way too big to only have five major cities. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, these days I think it's, it's a lot easier. Um mm-hmm it's it's easy to get around um and i think i mean it it is debatable because i'm sure there'd be a lot of um, mates listening that would probably put a good good argument in place that maybe it's not as easy as it has been but i think that um getting around is is far easier you can do it a national tour without breaking the budget um Mm -hmm. but you know we don't live we don't live in the middle of Europe. We don't live in the middle of North America yeah. where we can, yep. we can drive, you know, 20 minutes up the road and be in another city that's got a million yeah. people, you know, and yeah. um, or drive, you know, across five countries in a day or whatever it is, you know. So yeah. here yep. it's like, you know, if you want to drive, then prepare to blanket out a good 10 to 12 hours of, of travel mm. time in between and you better you better have, have a good playlist or, or some good books or something just to keep you, keep you sane and on those trips. So yeah. many, many bands will fork out the money to, to fly, which, you know, for the most part, it's, it's cheaper than it ever has been. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, I guess, I guess we, I guess we're used to the challenges, um, these days in mm-hmm. comparison and, to what they used to be. Is that because just your age, you're, you're more mature now, you know, what, what, you know, you've seen the industry thrown back at you and you went you know what i can take that i can adapt to this industry that's you know always changing and you go i still want to do it 
Um, yeah, I think, I, th- I mean, for me personally, definitely. I mean, you know, I wouldn't say I've, I've completely matured yet. I'm still getting there. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am more mature than I was in my early 20s. And, um, and I think that time and life experience and going through a lot of these changes and seeing how things have worked and not worked along the way, I've, I've certainly got far more resilience and, and also flexibility yeah. of being yeah. able to sort of take on those challenges. But on, in the same breath, a lot of the bands that are coming out now that are, that are just turning 18 and allowed to play in pubs, um, they're so switched on. Like and they they know how to do it and they they have they've they've got a tour manager they've got their schedule in place they've they're extremely business savvy um, and it's just the, that's the changing times I mean these guys have yeah. got access to information entrepreneur uh, being an entrepreneur is really really popular these days as well so you've got yeah. you've got kids wanting to start businesses in their early teens and so by the time they're eighteen they 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 you know they might not have the life experience as such but they've got uh, a degree of know-how that none of us would have even had an inch of that when we were <laughs> the same age. So yeah, you're starting to yeah. see, you're starting to see bands get a lot more headway a lot quicker because they're they're far more savvy and they've got more resources at their fingertips and mm-hmm. and that's exciting because it also opens the doors up for or existing doors up for some of us older bands that you know probably have struggled in years gone by and we've started to see oh wow like oh, is that how you do it oh that's kind of that's kind of cool i didn't know that and yeah. so yeah and for us to be already to be resilient and flexible we can sort of move along with that and change as well yeah yeah i i i have to agree with the the, the idea that you know they're they're coming accustomed to the, this industry that is changing because um like when i was growing up in the 90s you just wanted to be in a rock band to to make money and and you know drink booze but now it's like these kids aren't drinking booze and you know they're not doing it just to make money they're doing it because it's a passion for them yeah, yeah. and I, I like that that that's come back around rather than you know everyone just being wanting to be a rock star oh that's it and it's not i think there's i think there's still a bit of a bit of ego and a bit of imagery attached to it <laughs> and they want a persona yep. that's put out there but it's just a different type of persona and i think for the most part um, I wouldn't say completely, but I think for the most part, it's a healthier uh, persona that people want to put out there, especially when, you know, a lot of bands, as you said, like, you know, a lot of musicians don't drink anymore um, and are far more sort of embracing sort of health and well-being and things like that. I think there's a yeah. bit of virtue signaling at times with a, some of that stuff, but I think for the most part, people are far more switched on and they understand that, you know, a lot of this stuff can be a lot of fun but it does slow the process down and if you want yeah, something yeah. badly those sort of elements aren't going to uh aid you positively so, yeah um they yeah. sort of get it and they've they've worked that out earlier than uh, many of us did it, it at least took a lot of us uh most of our 20s to to yeah. try and shake that off and some of us um you know getting on uh, a bit older are still trying to shake it off mm. Well, I, you know, like having heard that, like I, I'm glad that I did set this comic in 1985 because it's it's not sensible. It's a much more fun thing to write, uh, like a, a story that's you know perhaps a bit absurd and uh, crazy. Um, but yeah, no, it's such a better thing for the industry to to, to be healthy and to be more business conscious and uh, you know not just to sign a deal without like having people read it. And um, I can imagine that happening quite a bit back in the day. Yeah, and and I think yeah. I mean, yeah, and that that's that's the climate of the industry at that at that stage. And I think the really cool thing now with with what you've done is that you will be able to connect with the people that live through that era and can mm-hmm. appreciate it. Um, but I think there's also, I mean, look, oh, I'm talking on behalf of an audience that I've got, you know, I've, I'm I'm not part of, so I could be just talking out of my ass right now. But I mean, I'm assuming that there could be an element of, of appreciation and interest from people that haven't experienced that era, um, that there might be some mystery, some mystery to it because yeah, a lot of these guys who may have a completely different path and different lifestyle to what many of us have had growing up, um, still idolize and still appreciate a lot of these classic, uh, bands from, from the eighties and the seventies mm. and, and even, even into the nineties now where, um, they're really sort of defining bands that define the genre or the subgenre or whatever it is. And so I think there'll be an element of interest and appreciation for it, even if they can't completely connect on a personal level, there'll be some sort yeah. of, oh, this yeah. is really interesting. This is cool. Like there's something fun yeah. about this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I hope I, I 
you know, the comic is is there for, you know, metalheads, yes, but um, it's got, like, broader appeal because everyone's heard a song that's kind of made them feel a bit different, you know. Uh, yeah. Like, everyone's got that, that song that makes them uh, feel like they can get through that day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I don't think there's even, like, a genre out there or a person who likes their specific genre and they hear, like, Back in Black by ACDC and they can't get behind that riff. <laughs> yeah. No matter who you are or what you listen to, you can go, okay, that's just a... A cracking song um yeah. yeah and you know i not it's not like a marketing thing where i want everybody to read it but um just having a, a niche audience makes it it's easier for me to 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 satisfy you know what do they want to hear what do they want this character to do so um a question that i've got from my end cause, mm-hmm. i mean this is this is going back to something i said really early in the in the beginning of our chat about dumb yep. questions so all right i so Thanks for sending a few copies of the comic up uh, or down. I'm trying to work out where mm-hmm. I live in the in the country. Um, yeah. And um, look, I read it, and I got to the end. And I'm like, oh, what? What? Where's the ending? Oh, I can't believe it! Like, oh, I'm left hanging. Yeah. Like, what's going on? And then I realised, oh yeah, you dummy! Like, they're comics. Like, there's a series <laughs> because it's been that long since I've read a comic or even understood what the hell a comic is that I've realised, oh, yeah. this is this is the first this is the first of, of a first, series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question that I've got is, and just from, I guess, the questions that you've been asking me, have you got a, like a, a framework in place of the entire sort of journey in place and you're sort of refining and tweaking everything in between and adding in those, those little Easter eggs and those little sort of nuances along the way, or is this something that as it progresses, you will adjust and move the story in whichever direction it naturally feels at the time? Um, no, I, I, I wrote a, a treatment for it. Um, so there was like the, the these key scenes and like these like lesser scenes that were more character development. Um, uh, but they, they were all, they're all written. Um, just the only thing that is likely to change for this next issue is the, um, is the scripts, like just how characters talk. And I feel like after working on it for so long, I have got better at making characters sound like they're got, they've got their own individual voice. Um, but if you know your followers or listeners are out there listening to this and they read the comic, uh, I'm struggling with that first scene in this next book. Nice. Uh, but yeah, the 90 percent of this first volume, which is about in my head, it's eight issues long, uh, and I hope that you know people do get behind it because it's going to make it. Uh, much more feasible. Like I don't want to have to wait another six years to get the next one done. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like if people get behind it, and then you know that that spurs me on uh, <coughs> as far as motivation goes. But also, you know, it's nice to get a to get a bit of money behind it so I can, you know, make this a priority. Um, but yeah, like the the treatment was is probably ninety percent written uh, as far as like those scenes and and what needs to happen. Uh, but that's not to say that you know. Like the like you say, those little nuances where things get added as I think of them. Um, so like one of the things that I think I just came up with like two weeks ago was um, uh, whenever Maurice is listening to a song, he uh, feels the power. But if he keeps on listening to that same song, it, it loses its uh, you know its effect on him. Uh-huh. Yeah, it kind of gets like that because you know, I, I get that as well. Like sure. if I every day if I listen to Master of Puppets on the way to work, at one point it's just not going to work anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's one of the Maurice's, you know, one of his, uh, his kryptonite. I, um, I can certainly appreciate that. I've, um, I've played albums to death and I've lost, yeah. like, I don't even know what I'm listening to anymore. And, yeah, yeah. and you, then you, then you did like, it's not even consciously sort of subconsciously you get distracted by another, another release on a new album or something you've discovered. So you become obsessed with that and then yeah. you neglect that album that you loved and then it might be years. And then yeah. you suddenly hear one song or you decide, Oh, I'll just chuck it on. And then suddenly it's like, wow. It's like it's, it's like it was, it's like yeah. that album just sat there on the shelf recharging over that, over that period of time. Like <laughs> yeah. it, all it's, all it's, all the, all the energy out of that album is drained away and over time it's just gradually just been building back up. It's, it's, up it's, yeah, a, it's like a battery. Yeah, yeah. It's at full capacity yeah. now and it's ready to, yeah. ready to unleash again. And it's just, it's, it's incredible. That's some, um, yeah. there you go. That's another example of, um, of something that's super relatable to, to people that really love music and love metal in particular. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that, that, that happened to me and, and, you know, I put a lot of me into this, this character, especially the way he, um, he, you know, 
he interacts with his sister, who's more of a you know the, the pop, uh, you know genre music. Uh, and you know for for readers uh, of the comic, and uh, I hope it comes across because one of the things that I really struggle with in the comic is having this visual medium and then having uh, um, the audio play such a, a pivotal role mm. in it. That I hope um, that when Maurice has got the headphones on, your assumption should be that he is listening to metal. Uh, but then having to put, you know, music notes, I just kind of, yeah, I didn't want to do that kind of stuff or, uh, put those, those massive big, uh, you know, comic book lines that make it look like something's happening or zooming in or zooming out. Like I I didn't want to overdo that. Uh, so when, um, when Jesse Han first got back to me with that, that his interpretation of what the comic could be, uh, I didn't picture it like that in my head. I was going full, full gloss, uh, 1994 style image comic, whereas, uh, you know, um, like just so professionally done, and when I saw this, I was like, "Oh, this is put it in a, in its setting. Like it is 1985. Even the the art style, it reminds me of like a an Archie comic. And I know Archie was you know set in the 60s, but uh, it, it just he really brought this thing to life. I have to, I've said that to every single person I've ever talked to about the comic, but um, you know, and, and I I didn't want to be precious of the, about that uh, because. Like, no one's going to be able to get into my head. And uh, I have clients because I'm a graphic designer, you know, magazine designer. Uh, and when they say just vague, you know, brief, um, and they say that's not how I pictured it in my head, uh, I go, well, that's just impossible. Uh, so I had to sacrifice a little bit there. Uh, but the way he did it, it was, yeah, it was mental how, how much better it was in his head than it was in mine. Well, Sir, thank you very much. Um, no, think, thank you, Andy. I think we might have to do a catch up some sometime down the track um, and talk a little bit more metal. Um, yeah. Any any excuse for me to sit down and and talk metal with somebody on there? So uh, we'll we'll, yeah. we'll do that again. Um, well, when you've got your show coming up, because uh, like I said, I, I I used to photograph metal bands, and now that my son is is a bit older, I can get out of the house occasionally. Uh, yeah, I'd love to come and photograph the band. Yeah, I got, so plug, 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 everyone listening. Uh, the 28th of June, so it's uh, Friday, and that's at the back room in Annalee, I believe. Annalee? I think it is. Um, yeah. So it seems to be a regular haunt up there now for a lot of a lot of metal shows. So Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, cool. looking forward to playing that. It's been it's been a little while since we played up in Brisbane, and I'm originally from Brisbane, um, born, okay. in, born in Redcliffe, and moved to Sydney to actually join the band that I'm in now and still in it. Um, yeah. so it's, um, it's been a hell of a journey. So every time I, I come back to Brisbane, it's like a little, little You're a conquering hero. Yeah. A little bit of a homecoming. It's, it's kind of cool. So um, I'm looking yeah. forward to coming back. So yes, if you, if you make it out, um, mm -hmm. yeah, please let me know. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Awesome, man. Well, well, and thanks for the support, Andy. Thanks for having the chat. It's oh. nice to, to talk about this comic and talk about metal. My absolute pleasure. As mentioned at the beginning of the episode, if you are in Brisbane on the 1st of June, Saturday the 1st of June, you can go to Crowbar in Fortitude Valley. Um, Aaron is launching the comic, issue one of Maurice in the Metal, at Crowbar and uh, is giving away free signed copies of the comic. So why not, hey? Um, it's part of the Heavy Metal Market Day. There's lots of things going on. Um, people selling and trading vinyl, um, there's pinball and arcade machines, there's metal and beer, of course, so maybe kick off your Saturday sesh a little bit earlier and uh, stop by Crowbar and say hello to Aaron. And make sure you tell him what you thought of the episode as well. And as mentioned at the beginning, also, I have two extra copies of Maurice in the Metal issue one. So if you are not in Brisbane or not planning to be in Brisbane on the 1st of June, you can hit me up and I will shoot you out a copy if you are one of the first two people. So there you go. Get amongst it. Um, Maurice dash and dash the dash metal.com or you can search for Maurice and the Metal on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, there's also a big cartel uh, website set up as well for the comic. But I'll have all the links in the show notes over at andysocial.net. Updates, updates, updates. Okay, a few updates before we wrap it up. I wish I had some more news to share with you all, but I don't really. And I am on the verge of having a mental breakdown. I feel like Mark Maron on his podcast. Um, <laughs> the new album doesn't have a release date yet. Um, we have something in mind of when we think it's going to happen, but we're still waiting on our friends in Japan and... I'm having a feeling that I could write a book just about this alone. Um, sometimes it feels, some days it feels like we're getting closer and closer and closer and very exciting and uh, very exciting. And then other days it just feels like it's all about to fall apart. So 
Who knows? Um, but it's interesting anyway. It's, it's content, isn't it? So we're getting we're getting somewhere. Um, but we're going to make some hard decisions soon anyway. So uh, we will keep you up to date. When we have the release date, we'll be announcing that everywhere. Um, the whole reason why it's getting held up is that Japan wants to release it before us. Um, and we just need to know when the hell they're going to release it. So once we get that, then we'll be able to announce the, the worldwide release date of Fallen Idols and share it all with you. Open up pre-orders and get the whole ball rolling. We've already worked out our plan of attack for the Australian tour. So if you are coming to see us on any of the dates for the Australian tour, uh, just don't freak out. We will have something there for you and uh, stay tuned. We'll give you some more info soon. Um, speaking of which, the Australian uh, tour dates start off in Canberra on the 21st of June. Uh, then it's the 28th of June in Brisbane. I'm thinking of this off the top of my head. The 29th of June in Perth the 5th of July in Melbourne, the 6th of July in Adelaide, and the 26th of July in Sydney. You can go over to lord.net.au, check out the tour dates. Um, if you use Bands in Town, the, all the dates are up on there as well, so make sure you RSVP. Tickets are on sale for all those dates, so make sure you grab your tickets in advance. It's a massive help to us, massive support to the local promoters and the local scenes. Uh, before we wrap it up, also Self Starter. Self Starter will be launching Season 2 on Monday morning, the 3rd of June at 5 a.m. And that will be a fortnightly release every Monday morning because that's just the way I roll. And I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of these great stories with you. And it'll be running from June to December and that will be season two. So we're almost finished wrapping up all the recordings. Uh, any last minute suggestions for guests, I'm happy to consider them. Otherwise, we are closing the doors and rolling this baby out. So looking forward to sharing all that with you. If you want to check out season one, you can go to selfstarter.com.au or check out uh, the podcast through whichever podcast player you listen through right now. Uh, and that's it. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch of stuff, but um, there's lots of updates coming in the coming weeks, um, whether it be bands or podcasts, etc. cetera. Um, as of the time of recording this, I'm about to pron um, pronounce pronounce here. That's probably a good, uh, good description. I'm going to be announcing a couple of the awards at the Australian Podcast Awards, um, which is the 18th of May in Sydney. So by the time you hear this, I would have already have done it and hopefully didn't stuff it up, but I'm um, looking forward to that. So thanks Dave Gertler from the Australian Podcast Awards for giving me that opportunity. It means a lot. So uh, lots of things happening. Oh, and I've got, um, I've got a little surprise coming soon. It's not heaps exciting, but it was a big thing for me. So I'm looking forward to sharing that all with you, especially if you're interested in starting your own podcast. And I'll leave it at that. Until next week, folks, take care. Bye-bye.